Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you, Akshay. Okay. I said. <laughs> oh, it's said there. I don't see everybody. Okay. So, hello, Sid. <laughs> I can see you. <laughs> okay. So then, let us start with our today's uh, special session, our 15th session uh, in Amachi Lab. Before we um, hand over to Professor Alex, uh, which we are really looking forward, I would have two small announcements. So an official welcome to everybody. Um, the first announcement is that um, we are changing our format slightly. So we still date the Amachi Labs weekly meet, um, sessions, where had a primary focus on research. And now we're shifting that uh, towards the project and its management. So the project management of, of our um, of our um, products or our developmental um, products. So from today onwards, <clears throat> it is not an Amachi Labs colloquium, but it's an Amachi Labs weekly project meeting. <clears throat> so the second announcement is, excuse me, <clears throat> the second announcement is that we have today also, beside Professor Alex, um, our E4 Life students, our international PhD um, students um, present. Um, it's voluntary for our E4 Life um, PhD students to participate in, in the sessions um, with, uh, with um, also after communicating with the guide. So also welcome to our new students, um, to our family. All right, so <clears throat> for those um, who, don't, who don't know me, my name is um, Dr. Meltem. I'm working at the Center for Women's Empowerment and High Quality and Amachi Labs um, together with my wonderful colleagues and we will have more often the opportunity to work together. So again, a warm welcome and I will hand over the word to Dr. Um, Sid to introduce our very appreciated guest of today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Whoops. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Malcolm. And I'd like to thank Meltem for organizing this and getting everything done in uh, the most meticulous way possible, which uh, we always expect and get from uh, from uh, Meltem. So just a few words about Alex. <clears throat> but first of all, to our new PhD students, Alex, these are students who are just now uh, starting their course of studies at uh, Amachi Labs. And it's part of um, a larger program. Um, so to the students, I want to tell you that um, this is just how academic life is, an aspect of academic life. You have faculty members, scientists, scholars, uh, talking about their ideas with others, engaging in uh, debate and uh, defending positions when people disagree, things of that nature. It is as long as or as old as the tradition of uh, the sciences and in the West at least extends back um, 400, 500 years. So uh, Alex, so Alex, uh, I have the uh, great fortune to call Alex a good friend. Uh, I first met him in Israel. I invited him to uh, attend a uh, small workshop. And from the moment that he uh, appeared and from the articles that he wrote, uh, I felt a certain kinship with him. Now, Alex is, uh, in addition to being a fine young man he is also uh, the leading i think the leading person in the area of uh, ethology teaching in particular among non-human animals mostly in the wild and his work uh, began with and made a big splash on meerkats 
um, you read the article about that and trying to establish the idea of what teaching is like in non-human animals and getting into the debate about uh, cognitive processes, uh, whether we want to use them or not when we're making our definitions of teaching, but uh, you'll hear about that today, I'm pretty sure. So here we have in front of us uh, one of the major figures in uh, the area of animal behavior uh, in general, in particular teaching, but it's not only that, it's not, his work is not exclusively on teaching. He's worked with a number of uh, animal types. He's with, worked with meerkats. He's now working with <clears throat> uh, jackdaws, which are related to ravens and is doing superb work there as well. And last thing, uh, over the years, I've had the good fortune to, uh, to meet Alex. Uh, both in Israel, that was the first time uh, in Eritrea, Sicily, in Paris. Um, I went uh, last year, I think. I visited him uh, at Cornwall at the University of Exeter. And I was always and remain always uh, uh, in admiration of the level and quality of work uh, that he's uh, done and what he's taught all of us in his work on uh, teaching. So Alex, thank you very much for taking time out. It's 7.30 in the morning there uh, in England and uh, getting up early uh, to speak with us is uh, a big honor for us as well. So thank you very much again for uh, presenting your ideas. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a huge pleasure and for the incredibly um, beautiful introduction. I'm very flattered. So thank you very much indeed, Sid. And uh, yeah, well, I suppose without further ado, I shall get cracking. So I need to share my screen. Um, OK. So. Could somebody just give me an indication that you can see this? Yeah. Yes. Thumbs up. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Really visible. Fabulous. Okay. Well, I shall get cracking then. Okay. So, what I'd like to talk to you all about today is the function and mechanisms of teaching. So, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm a I'm an evolutionary biologist by training, um, and I've spent the majority of my career studying wild animals and trying to understand why they behave in the ways that they do. But I've also spent parts of my career in psychology laboratories in various places, and I'm also very interested in trying to understand human culture and the origins of human culture. So a lot of my work sort of transcends the boundaries between biology and psychology. So we'll start with Kant. Kant famously said, man is the only being who needs education. And so in large part, this talk is really asking the question, well, was Kant right? And as is often the case in academia, it really depends on your definition, how you define teaching. Now, traditionally, there have been two major sets of definitions that have been used in the literature, particularly in the anthropological and psychological literature. One of these definitions is essentially based on the archetypal Western schoolroom setting. So according to this definition, teaching is unidirectional. I'm the teacher, you're the pupils, I am providing information to you, it's going one way. It's formal, there is a sort of marked, explicit way of setting out that what we are doing now is teaching, it's not happening in the course of our everyday activities, and it involves explicit verbal instruction rather than perhaps more subtle uh, cues that might be used through hand gestures or eye gestures and so on. So this is uh, a very common definition that's been used in the, in the anthropology literature, and on the basis of this definition, 
a lot of anthropologists concluded that teaching didn't occur in many human societies. So, for example, hunter-gatherer societies were said to lack teaching. From a scientific perspective, this, this definition has a number of problems. First of all, it's entirely subjective. It's just based on a sense of what we in Western classrooms do rather than any theoretical uh, underpinning. As I mentioned- Alex, yeah. Alex I'm, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting two things. Um, one is, could you make the uh, slide uh, cover the entire screen? Because what we see on the left-hand side all of the slides that are uh, coming up. That's number one. And number two, um, I think that you've moved along in the uh, slides that you have. But for the moment, what we have on the screen is the first slide. Oh, really? That's very strange. OK. Yeah. Um, I'm not You're quite sure why that is, because I'm in full screen mode. Let me just uh, exit. Do you, have, do you have a dual screen? No, I'm on a single laptop at the moment. Um, bizarre. OK. Try to reshare. Is, is there a presenter view on it? Uh, presenter view. view. OK, uh, how would I find that? OK, well, hang on, uh, I'm just going to. Am I, am I still sharing my screen? I'm going to stop yes. sharing. OK, yes. stop sharing. OK. And, Thank uh, you, Dr. Alex. Again. <laughs> on the top menu, you would go into slideshow, at least on uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, and that would yeah. have a box that you can check that says presenter view, okay. and that would allow that to show. Um, show we would we would see the the okay. PowerPoint. Right now, we're just uh, seeing the 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 um, part that you would see yeah, if yeah, you yeah, were, okay. you know, with. OK, so that's what yeah, it says. Use presenter view is is ticked. It is. Oh, yeah, on. it is. Yeah. Um, Can you see I, this? Yeah. You want to untick it. I want to untick it. Oh, OK. Fair enough. Let's try that. Any better? Can you see uh, a slide that says Western culture centric on it? Did you go slideshow start? If you at the top, you have slideshow selected, but just select like from current slide and see if that doesn't. OK, from foot. Well, shall I do from current yeah, slide? Just, yeah, just click it and see what happens. OK, how about that? Um, maybe you need to check the presenter view box. <laughs> oh, OK, again, it's showing on my screen. This is strange. Um, I've been doing this on Zoom a lot recently and it worked, but uh, strange it's not working on here. OK, let's try use presenter view again from current slide. Uh, Any good? I, I also would like to use the seconds while we are um, trying to make the presenter a few to also mention our director, uh, Professor Bavani. I apologize. Uh, I, I uh, didn't um, mention knowingly that she's part of, uh, of course, uh, the plenum. Um, um, so, Professor Bavani, um, if you would like to uh, also say something or add something to what we said, uh, uh, please. Um, do do now. So again, my apologies. Um, Professor Bavani is our director for both centers, and uh, she was also very excited to welcome you today. But Professor Bavani, the word is yours. No, no, please. I don't want to interrupt anything. Uh, I'm just I'm happy to listen, and we will talk later. Okay. okay. Thank you. you. Can you click on this uh, start slideshow button that's up here on the left side, right above your slide two? Uh, one thing that says start slideshow. Can you see my screen at the moment? Yeah, so right below this thing where you're mousing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that doesn't, uh, that's just a, the section for this whole section. So I can start from the beginning, from the current slide, or present online. Hmm. Maybe you. Okay. I've just clicked from the beginning. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see that. I think maybe that's the way to go. Okay. Uh, if I go through okay, the slides now, maybe, uh, does that change the, the slide? One more. I, I think we can go forward this way. I think we can just go forward this way. Just leave. I think leave it. It's okay. Yeah. Can, so can you see the the current slide with a picture of Kant on it, or is that not still not showing? Not showing. <coughs> 
That is bizarre, isn't it? There it is. There it is. Obviously, the slideshow that I can't. Um... We can see now. Yeah, OK, did that change slides? Yes. You should now say was Kant right? Yeah. Yeah, so we're we're good to go. Yes. But you have to select the, the, the slides on the left so that we can see them. OK, I'm just in full screen view going through the slides because that you can't see the slides at the moment. We can see the slides, but um, uh, on the left hand side is uh, are all the slides. Uh, and what do you have now? Definitions of teaching. <clears throat> That's in the center, and you're on the anthropocentric part now. Okay. Well, I'm not quite sure what is going on because it should be in full screen view. But uh, anyway, mm -hmm. shall I just carry on as is, or does anybody have yeah. any suggestions? Yeah. Uh, oh, just, uh, maybe try this uh, monitor uh, automatic. Try changing that to something else. Yeah, that, uh, that monitor be. primary monitor. OK, I've changed it to primary monitor. Sorry, yeah. somebody just said something there. Maybe I could. Yeah, try that. Maybe okay, close let's... your PowerPoint and reopen it. OK, well, let me try this uh, primary monitor thing. If that doesn't work, I'll close the PowerPoint and reopen it. OK. Has that changed anything? Can you now see the full screen? Um, no. No, OK, I'm going to try. Interview box ticked. Um, we, we, we would have two options now. Either we just carry on and um, have the have a stronger opportunity to listen much, much more carefully and much more alert, or um, uh, a colleague, maybe um, um, Ajay, could uh, share the screen, um, the slides. Um, Do you know what the other thing I could try is um, just showing you the PDF? Just yeah. going through this as a PDF, so it means I won't have the um, the animations, but we could try that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Thornton, one, one more thing. There's an yeah. option called open open share tray within the Teams app itself, next okay. to the camera and the microphone, open share tray. You might be able to select a different um, a different view from your screen that may be more effective. Uh, and if this doesn't work, then maybe the PDF is the best option. OK, so just sorry, run me through where that was. Open share tray. At least for me, it's next to the turn camera on off and then mute your microphone or speak. Okay. And next to that is a box with a down arrow called share tray. OK, yeah, so I had that's what I had on. Yeah, share. Um, OK, so, so I have several different options I can choose from it. My Yes, so this just shows all of the um, tabs that I have open on my computer. So I'm just going to close the PowerPoint, reopen it. We'll have one more go at this, and if it doesn't work, I'll uh, I'll try a PDF. All right, Alex, maybe you could uh, share the desktop, the whole desktop. Maybe that would help. Uh, okay, uh, is there a way to do that? Share the desktop. Okay. I'm sharing my desktop now. Does that do anything? Yes. Perfect. Yeah? Yes. yes. Oh, all right. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you, Dr. Alex. Also no for you. No problem. Well, thank you for the <laughs> suggestion, <laughs> whoever that was. Um, all right. Where was I? Here, I think. OK, so when we're talking about these Western culture centric definitions, um, I think from a scientific point of view, they're, they're just not very useful because they're far too subjective. They give us no indication of what teaching might be, what conceptually what it is, or in understanding how it evolved because they a priori exclude most forms of human teaching. The other classic area of definitions is, is anthropocentric. So it's largely based on a, on a folk psychological intuition of how we as humans teach. And typically these definitions emphasize the intention to teach. I am teaching you because I want you to learn something and I'm doing that explicitly. I'm cognitively aware of that intention. And people often emphasize here cognitive prerequisites such as theory of mind, 
I recognize that your mental states might be different to my own, and that's why I'm teaching you. And metacognition, I'm able to assess my own knowledge in order to best teach you. But again, these anthropocentric definitions have a number of problems. In particular, they are completely impractical. If we want to go out and study teaching where it occurs, then any definition that's based on an unobservable cognitive mechanism is of very little use. We can't go out and, exp and see theory of mind. You can only infer uh, cognitive processes through experimentation. So this doesn't help us in order to find where teaching occurs. And secondly, from a more fundamental perspective, I think that these definitions that require certain cognitive prerequisites confuse function and mechanism. So to illustrate this, I'm going to show you a quotation from a very famous developmental psychologist, Mike Tomasello. So Tomasello, quoted in a book back in the 90s, said, why would you attempt to teach someone something unless you assumed that they did not know something? Right. So the underlying assumption here is that one cannot teach unless one has the ability to recognize ignorance in pupils and intentionally sets about to correct it. But I want to just show you what would happen if we replaced some of these words. So we retain a sentence that is um, logically identical, but we replace a few of the words. What if we replaced it with why would you attempt to use a tool unless you understood how the tool works? So this is the same kind of idea. This would be saying if you don't know how your tool works, then what you're doing is not tool use. But of course, we know that there are many animals that use tools. So I've just given you three examples here. This ant lion down here is a species of invertebrate that makes a little pit trap. And when ants walk past it, throws sand at the, at the ants and they fall in the trap and it eats them. This capuchin monkey is using a hammer and an anvil to crack a nut. This Galapagos finch is using a twig as a tool to extract grubs. And there have been a lot of experiments that have shown that by and large, these animals do not understand how their tools work in terms of cause and effect, but nevertheless, they are able to use their tools effectively because tool use has evolved in these species as an adaptation, which does not require an understanding of the underlying causal structure of the problem. And if you think about humans, hopefully you can see this as well. So there's a guy using his vacuum cleaner to uh, vacuum the lawn. We as humans often use tools without fully understanding how they work. And in fact, this example that we've just had now with the uh, with the laptop and me trying to share my screen with you is, an, is a perfect example of that, right? I don't actually understand the underlying principles through which a laptop works, nor do most of you, I would hazard a guess, but we're still able to use them. So I think it's really important not to confuse function, which is what a behavior is for, with mechanism, which is the means by which that behavior is achieved. So a behavior with a given function can be achieved through a number of different mechanisms. And a third problem with anthropocentric definitions is that, again, they're highly restrictive. So if we decide that certain human cognitive processes are a fundamental part of the definition for teaching, then we're excluding the possibility of even looking for teaching in other animals. And it also arguably excludes many forms of human teaching. So many of the forms of teaching that we use as parents. So this mother here is helping her child learn how to walk. In a classroom setting, we're often not explicitly aware of the knowledge states of all of our pupils. Imagine giving a lecture to hundreds of uh, university students, but nevertheless, we're capable of teaching. So, Rather than these anthropocentric definitions, I've tended to advocate a functional perspective of teaching. And according to this view, there are three key characteristics to teaching. The first is that it's a form of cooperative behavior with response dependent fitness payoffs. And what that means in terms of, of evolutionary biology is that 
both individuals, for, for a trait to evolve, both individuals have to have positive fitness payoffs. They have to gain something in terms of that reproductive fitness, ultimately. And so this means that both the pupil has to benefit and the teacher benefits as a result of helping the pupil. Secondly, the function of teaching is to facilitate learning in others. And third, it involves the coordinated interaction of a donor and a receiver of information. But we're completely neutral here about the mechanisms through which this may be achieved. Back in 1992, Tim Caro and Mark Hauser, a biologist and a psychologist respectively, provided an operational definition that allows us to go out and look for teaching where it occurs. So first of all, this involves a knowledgeable individual modifying its behaviour in the presence of a naive individual. So the knowledgeable individual isn't just going about its daily business, it's doing something different. The knowledgeable individual must incur some cost or at least derive no immediate benefit by modifying its behaviour. So again, it's not doing this because it benefits in the present time, it's doing it as a long-term investment in helping another individual to learn. And so the third criterion is that the naive individual should learn as a result of the knowledgeable individual's behaviour. And an important point to remember here is that these, this operational definition and the criteria I showed you are definitions on a population level. So this is what we expect to see on a population level. It doesn't necessarily mean that every single instance of teaching ever is going to result in learning. Sometimes you try and teach pupils and they don't learn anything. But if on average they never learn anything, then the trait cannot evolve. So I'll get into the evidence now. So I think Sid sent round um, this, this paper. So in meerkats, what the meerkats do is that when the pups are very young, the adults will go out and they catch prey and they kill it and they bring it to the pups. As the pups start to get older, the adults will increasingly bring prey that's still alive. So the pups have to practice handling it, but they've got the support of the adults there. And often what the adults will do is they'll modify the prey in some way. So one of meerkat's favourite kinds of food are scorpions. So when adults give a pup a scorpion, they'll often bite the sting off the scorpion and present it to the pup. So the pup has the opportunity to practice handling the scorpion without the risk of getting stung. So you can see here in this graph that as the pups get older along the x-axis here, the probability that any given prey item is fed intact increases. And that happens both for scorpions shown here in the uh, white squares and for other mobile prey shown here with the black diamonds. And they're a bit more cautious with the scorpions than they are with other kinds of mobile prey. So I'm hoping that this video is going to work. We don't need the sound. So here you can see an adult meerkat biting the sting off a scorpion. Then a little pup comes in and takes the scorpion. And you can see that the adult stays behind to monitor what the pup is doing. And handling a live scorpion is still extremely difficult for this little pup, even though it no longer has a sting. So it's a challenge, and that means that the adult has to spend a fair bit of time hanging around watching what the pup is doing. Often the pups will lose the, the prey, so the adults catch it and bring it back again. They might modify it further if necessary. So now our little pup has got his scorpion and run off. So the second criterion of Karen Hauser's definition was that there should be some cost involved for the teacher. And as you can see from that video, giving away live prey is clearly rather costly. If you give away a prey that's still alive rather than one that you've killed, it means that you need to spend more time monitoring the pups. There's the risk that the prey might escape. So you've lost your investment. And you can see that here in this graph that as pups uh, get older, the probability that prey will escape declines. And for any given age, prey is far more likely to escape or to be lost if it's intact than if it's just disabled. So there are these costs for the adults in doing it. In fact, it takes an adult meerkat a fraction of a second to kill a scorpion. So if all you wanted to do was feed the pup, it'd be far easier to just kill the, kill the prey and give it to the pup. So why are they going through this rigmarole of giving away live prey that might escape? Well, the answer is that it promotes learning. So this is 
probably the hardest of the three criterion to test because, of course, if a little meerkat pup is getting better at hunting as it gets older, that could simply be because it's getting bigger, its dexterity is improving, etc. It could have nothing to do with what the adults are doing. So in order to try and test whether what the adults are doing has a causal effect on pups acquisition of hunting skills, my colleague Katie McAuliffe and I ran an experiment where we effectively became adult meerkats. So we started giving a number of pups a set number of live scorpions every day for four days. Then we gave a number of their siblings the same number of dead scorpions every day and a third lot of siblings an equivalent mass of hard boiled egg as a control. We then on the fifth day tested them all with a live scorpion and lo and behold the ones that had had the additional practice in handling live scorpions were much better so 100 percent of them were successful in catching the scorpion they were also much faster and they were less likely to get pincered on the nose so it seems here that what the adult meerkats are doing is providing their pups with otherwise unavailable opportunities to learn how to handle prey for themselves and if we look across the animal kingdom there's now strong experimental evidence for teaching in a number of species. So meerkats, interestingly a species of ant, tandem running ants, and various different bird species. And you'll notice that none of these are particularly large brained animals, none of them are particularly closely related to humans. So this idea that teaching should happen in things that are like us doesn't really seem to be borne out in the literature. There's also suggestive evidence for teaching in a number of different species, which you can see here at the bottom. I think the most persuasive is probably in cheetahs and other uh, members of the cat family that do something very similar to what the meerkats are doing. So in this picture here, a mother cheetah has just released a live impala for her cubs to practice with. So if we adopt a functional perspective, then meerkats clearly teach. But how do they do it? So again, going back to, to the traditional view in psychology, which is exemplified here in a quote from Sid, I hope you won't mind me using it again, Sid. Um, in order to teach, one needs to know when knowledge, beliefs, skills, etc. are missing, incomplete or distorted, as well as how people learn. So the idea here is that if I do not recognize your ignorance, I can't set about to correct it. But actually, there may be simpler mechanisms through which animals can teach effectively without necessarily needing to reason about the knowledge states of their pupils. And this is what the meerkats do. So these are pictures of a pup when it's 35 days old and pup when it's 85 days old. So this little pup here has just emerged from the burrow where it was born, whereas this bigger one here is almost at the stage where it's nutritionally independent and can look after itself. And just as children's voices change as they get older, the pup's voices change as they get older. They get a bit deeper, for example. And the pups wander around making these constant begging calls, asking for food. And what seems to happen is that the adults listen to those calls and they respond accordingly. I think you probably can't hear the audio, so I'm just going to skip that. So we ran some experiments where we recorded pups of different ages and then played them back. So if we recorded the calls of old pups and played them to groups that had young pups, the adults started to bring live prey, which then just escaped because the pups were far too young to deal with it. Conversely, if you play the calls of young pups to groups with old pups, the adults start to bring dead prey, even though by this stage the pups are perfectly capable of dealing with live prey. So the mechanism here is actually a very simple stimulus response mechanism that determines the probability that adults will kill the prey before giving it to the pups. Very, very simple, and it doesn't require theory of mind or anything like it. So in fact, I would argue that we can think of teaching and theory of mind as overlapping Venn diagrams. And even this is even true in human teaching. So I think there are certain forms of human teaching, such as infant directed speech and scaffolding that we use uh, when teaching young 
children that we are unaware of even doing it. And it's interesting that, for example, people use infant directed speech for this kind of very stereotyped way of slowing down your, your words, hyper articulating vowels and so on. People do that across pretty much all human cultures. We also do it when we speak to our pets. We even do it when we talk to robots that have baby like faces. So it seems that this is a pretty automatic response to baby like stimuli. We're not thinking, oh, this baby doesn't know how to speak. I better teach it. We just do it automatically. And one area that I've been looking at recently is teaching by people with autism. So people with autism typically struggle to attribute mental states automatically. So they, they tend not to do very well in tasks involving theory of mind. But we're finding in our work that nevertheless they are able to teach quite effectively by using cues, because if you think about it, whenever somebody makes a mistake, that gives you an observable cue. You don't necessarily need to be thinking in terms of their mental states. So why teach? The first reason why meerkats teach is because the information from an evolutionary perspective is a very high fitness value. So mobile prey account for more than 50% of the meerkat diet. So here this little pup is eating a snake. This guy here is eating a solifuge or a sun spider, which is a very aggressive kind of arachnid. This pup here is eating a paraboothid scorpion that has neurotoxins powerful enough to kill a human being. So a pup that doesn't learn how to hunt effectively for all of these different prey types is not going to be alive for very long. So there's very, very important fitness value of this information. There's also a very high utility of the information. And what I mean by utility is that it's very, very difficult to learn the information without teaching. The reason for that is that improving your prey handling skills requires practice. So that means that observing others is ineffective. That's not going to do it. So it's the same thing as, you know, if you imagine Homer Simpson watching sports on TV, he's not going to become a fantastic sports player as a result of watching people playing sports on TV because you need to practice these skills. And the same is true for the meerkats. It's also true that pups rarely find prey for themselves, so they lack the opportunities to practice and incompetent attempts at handling prey could be dangerous. So all of this means that unless the adults provide them with opportunities to learn, it's going to be very difficult for the pups to acquire these skills. So those are the, the key reasons why we think teaching might evolve in the animal kingdom. But why do we as humans teach? I've been exploring this uh, recently through some work led by my postdoc Amanda Lucas up here. Well, we've been very interested in the idea of cumulative culture. So something that seems to distinguish the kinds of culture that we see in humans from the culture that we see in other animals is its cumulative nature. So we build upon the inventions of previous generations. Things improve in efficacy and complexity over time. We can see that here with cutting tools, for example. But of course, you know, the computers that we're all using right now are all products of cumulative culture. So we were interested to try and find out if teaching plays a role in cumulative culture and how the evolution of cumulative culture and the evolution of teaching might interplay with each other. So to do this, we design what's called a transmission chain experiment. A transmission chain experiment is where somebody, for example, builds a tool in our case. So say I build a tool, then Sid has an opportunity to learn from me. Meltem has an opportunity to learn from Sid and so on. And so we go down a chain of people and we can test whether the tools change in either efficacy or complexity over time. So in our experiment, we had three social learning conditions. One was emulation, where people see the tool made by the previous person, but they don't get to observe that person or interact with them. The second was imitation, where observers can watch somebody else making a tool. And the third was teaching, where once I've made my tool, I stay behind to help you make your own tool. And we also had as a comparison a situation where one individual would use asocial learning, so they learn individually and make 10 tools themselves one after another. And we compared two different types of tools. One was a very simple tool made out of paper, and both of these tools have the same goal, which is to carry as many marbles as possible. 
The paper tool is made from a single sheet of paper. The, the participants have to make a tool that will carry marbles and float on water. The complex tool is made out of pipe cleaners and pipe cleaners can be woven in lots of different ways and it's actually very difficult just by looking at a tool to infer its mode of construction. So what we find is that teaching is only advantageous when tools are causally opaque. So when it's hard to infer how they were made through observation alone. So with our paper tools over here, these are all our different conditions, a social learning, emulation, imitation and teaching. There's no difference between any of these. So across we have 10 experimental generations and across the generations, the tools improve regardless of condition. Whereas with the pipe cleaner tools, we see this, these differences between treatments. So the asocial condition does particularly well, but the teaching condition does considerably better than either of the two other conditions. And in fact, statistically, the teaching condition and the asocial condition are not distinguishable. So it seems here that teaching provides advantages that are equivalent to basically 10 lifetimes worth of learning through your own efforts. And in particular, it seems that what teaching is good at is preserving high fidelity innovations. So if what these figures show is the relationship between the score of any particular tool and the score of its successor. So you can see that if I've made a really, really good tool that say carries 200 marbles, your tool is likely to be worse. It's difficult to copy to produce a tool that's as good as a very high performing tool. But in the pipe cleaner tools, in these more opaque tools, that relates. Uh, Dr. Alex, I think um, you are muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, wonderfully. Yeah, thank you. I think he disconnected. Oh, yeah. Then uh, we just wait uh, for a few seconds. Uh, he might log in in a couple of seconds. So maybe... Um, Dr. Sid, do you have uh, the possibility to contact him? Maybe he has some technical difficulties. Okay, I'll, <clears throat> I'll send him uh, something. I'll send him a uh, WhatsApp. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, okay. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Oh, okay. Welcome I don't know what happened there. It said someone in the meeting had muted me. Uh, yes. Anyway, yes. Yes. This happened. Back. Happened okay. also to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. So let me try and get back to where I was. Share desktop. Okay. Can we all see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. OK, so what uh, what this suggests to us is that in human societies, teaching the teaching emerged probably with an increasing reliance on complex tools. So we can make tools that increase in complexity. We can have cumulative culture in the absence of teaching. But as these tools start to get more complex, this generates selection for teaching. And so these two things start to co-evolve. And finally, I just want to show you um, some results from work that we're, we're still finishing at the moment um, where we were testing the role uh, where we were comparing typically developing children with children with autism spectrum disorders. So in this experiment, we had pairs of children working together to build tools. And again, these were these pipe cleaner tools. So here in yellow, we can see here that participant one and participant two are working together to build a tool. Participant one then stays behind to become a teacher. So that's what uh, the blue boxes represent. And participant three comes in and builds with two and so on. So you go, uh, this is a replacement um, kind of experiment. And so the key result here is that again, through the experimental generations, 
the tools improve in efficacy, these slopes are positive. Um, and this happens both in the typically developing and in the autistic children. So by and large, the autistic groups uh, tools tend to perform a bit worse than the typically developing kids, but nevertheless, they both show these positive scores. So that suggests to me that despite the, um, the socio-cognitive differences of people with autism, they are nevertheless able to teach effectively and to use their teaching to produce ever more effective tools. So to conclude, from an evolutionary point of view, teaching involves an investment in helping others to learn. For teaching to evolve, the fitness benefits have to outweigh the costs of this investment. The emergence of human cumulative culture might generate selection for teaching. And perhaps the most important point is that teaching may operate through a diversity of different mechanisms. So with that, I shall say thank you to all of you and just acknowledge all my wonderful collaborators shown here. So Katie McAuliffe and Nikki Rehani have worked with me on teaching in non-human animals. Amanda Lucas, Frankie Appe and Christine Caldwell on teaching in humans and all the uh, funders who've given me money to do this over the years. So thank you very much. Close this uh, So, Alex, um, <clears throat> thank you very, very much. Um, so let's open it up to questions, answers, uh, provocations, uh, whatever. So why don't whoever is interested in asking questions, why don't you do it rather than raising your hands? And uh, it's probably the best way to work it out. So can I start? Yeah, sure. Hi, this is Tour. I'm a SID student for a long time. Um, so, first of all, incredible, very, very interesting uh, uh, presentation and results. Um, the Meerkat paper was uh, incredible to read. Um, I'm coming from the computer science uh, um, perspective, uh, I should say, in a sense. Um, and uh, you probably know that we deal with uh, evolution algorithms as well in order to try to um, try to pinpoint uh, behaviors that are um, that evolution might uh, find as a solution to some problem. And um, about 20 years ago, Sid and I tried to do that uh, for a very simple population. Uh, a very simple problem and a very simple pupil and uh, student and uh, teacher population and the results were uh, how would I say not conclusive um, I fully understand the perspective of I, I guess uh, some of it the evolution perspective but I was wondering whether you tried collaborating with uh, today's AI is much much more advanced than what we tried 20 years ago. <clears throat> I was wondering if you tried to kind of figure out whether this is an evolutionary solution to some problem. Fitness problem, okay, maybe there are other solutions. Um, <clears throat> um, so that that is uh, that is the, my first uh, question. Maybe if we have time, well, I have some more. So. OK, um, yes, so where to begin? Um, I personally have have not been involved in, in AI work in this context. Um, in fact, I'm not sure that there is any AI work that I know of kind of very explicitly looking at teaching, but there are theoretical models. So they're, you know, they're not um, necessarily kind of machine learning models or anything like that, um, but there are theoretical models. So for example, agent based models that have explored the evolution of teaching and sorry, I've just got a cat that's jumped on top of me. Excuse me, cat. Got tangled up in my ear. There we go. Um, yeah, so these theorists, there's a model by Laurel Fogarty, for example, a few years ago. Um, and that model, the, the, the conclusions of that model um, basically show exactly what we had predicted in our, in our kind of verbal models. Um, and in fact, they also predicted this effect whereby um, cumulative culture should generate selection for teaching. So it's 
it's nice that our, our empirical results seem to be supporting this this modeling work. So you believe that uh, <clears throat> evolution algorithms that the computer scientists work uh, would show teaching in the relevant scenarios? Well, I wouldn't say that there are evolutionary models that computer scientists work with. These are these are evolutionary models that evolutionary biologists have worked with. So they, you know, there may well be stuff going on in the AI world that I don't know about. Um, but certainly there are there are theoretical computational models out there um, that illustrate the conditions under which teaching should evolve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tsur, also for the question and um, Dr. Alex for this wonderful answer. Any other questions we would like to ask? Um, Dr. Yes, Alex, the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much for a really, really fascinating discussion. And um, I also studied evolutionary biology, so I can appreciate uh, a lot of what you're talking about. And I also feel you're so fortunate to have found um, some animal behavior study that had not been looked at deeply. Because I remember when I went to school a long, long time ago, uh, I really would, would have loved to have studied behavior on some level or of some species somewhere. And there's just so much that had already been done. <laughs> um, but I was wondering now, so now this is like a, a focus. It's um, probably growing in some ways, uh, people are looking at teaching. And is there like a research being done on uh, like a spectrum of instinct? Like you, okay, you, you, you know, you, you put across these ideas of, of or uh, definitions of what learning is and what education is, but do you have you have you put in also uh, the idea of a spectrum of of instinct like this? This is closer to what you would have done instinctually and so on. Um, I, I might need to ask you for a little bit of clarification there. So I guess I mean, just generally speaking, um, I think it's fair to say that evolutionary biologists are very cautious of the word instinct. In fact, a very famous ethologist Pat Bateson wrote a famous essay called Taking the Stink Out of Instinct. Um, so it's a very nebulous word, which we tend to try and avoid using. So I wonder if you could just um, explain to me what, what you mean by it and how it would, how it relates to the issues we're talking about. Well, I haven't really thought it out too much, but say um, versus a reaction versus a teaching moment. Uh, and uh, I can't think of anything right off hand, but uh, just not using the word instinct, just okay. a response, a response yeah. that would come automatically versus a response that has several steps involved that looks like it uh, at, at, at a cost um, to the, the species to do it. Okay, so I mean, I, I think perhaps something that's relevant there is thinking about um, the extent to which teaching itself is learnt. Right, so it seems that the the meerkats, for example, teach without needing to learn how to teach. So I've done right. some analyses where I've compared um, adult meerkats who have had, who've cared for pups before, so they have experience of caring for pups, or adults who are the same age but haven't cared for pups before, and there are no right. detectable differences between those. So oh, it seems that in this situation, learning plays a minimal role. It's at least not very clearly detectable. That doesn't mean that it plays no role. Um, whereas, of course, in, in human societies, learning plays an enormous role in the way that, that mm -hmm. we teach and the particular styles that we teach in. So you know, it's one of the reasons why teaching is so variable across different cultures, for instance, is because it's learned. And in fact, Celia Hayes, a, a famous um, psychologist, has argued that actually human teaching is largely culturally evolved rather than necessarily genetically evolved. So I think from if, if, if I'm getting the right kind of angle yeah, on your question, yeah, yeah. then just, there is there uh -huh. is clearly a, a very large spectrum there in terms of of the role of prior experience and also flexibility. So, you know, we've meerkats teach in one context and one context alone. We've recently been doing uh -huh. some other work to see if they teach in the context of teaching their pups uh, how to recognize predators and the answer is no they don't so they only teach their pups how to hunt 
whereas we teach in, in, an, in an almost infinite number of different contexts. I think that's largely because we have language. And so that means that you know we can talk about things that are in the past and the future. Critically, I can tell you what not to do, which is really hard to, to teach in the absence of language. Mm -hmm. But overall, in a population, it might be a natural thing with humans that we somehow take for granted that we're, you know, we have to teach everything. Maybe there are some things that come naturally, but we yeah. don't see it as a natural thing. But but in a broader perspective, in a broader sense. Anyway, well, that's I'll certainly true. Else. I mean, if you, um, <laughs> Sid and I are both friends with with Barry Hewlett, who's a, an anthropologist who works on the Aka tribe in, in Central Africa. Um, and, you know, people who study hunter-gatherers, they know that a lot of the things that we think need to be kind of explicitly taught to children are not explicitly taught in those societies. Yeah. That doesn't mean to say, I think in the past, people have concluded from that that hunter-gatherers don't teach. And that's not the case. They do teach. They just teach in more subtle ways. That's that anthropomorphic perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah Madam. Um, um, we have uh, raised hands from <clears throat> um, Professor Bhavani and Rajesh, sir. Um, just one question or an inspiration. If we maybe ask a question, we could activate our, our video so Dr. Alex could also see the, the person who is asking the question and it's more personal. Yeah, that would be nice. Thank you. Okay. I'll just, I'm just going to say hi. Am I there? Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm the one hi. that just hi. went on and on and on. So. Thank you. Hello, madam. Thank you. How do I undo this now? Rajesh, do you want to go first? I can go after you. OK, um, so um, thanks for this lecture. It's very fascinating. Um, uh, I have a question regarding the transfer learning that you were talking about, like how does transfer learning take place in humans versus animals? Uh, is it because of the abstract thinking or the symbolic thinking we have or some element of uh, consciousness that we can project um, our mm -hmm. learning into some other context that the animals lacks? What, what is the reasoning behind the lack of uh, transfer of learning to other aspects? Um, I think there's no single answer to that. There's a whole host of, of, of different issues at play. Um, so I think all of the things that you raised are probably important. I guess the other thing is that, you know, when we when we think about we think about teaching as a social interaction, but that doesn't mean that our individual cognitive abilities don't come into play. So, for example, when you're teaching me something, I might be thinking about, you know, the causal structure of the problem as well. And there's very good evidence that humans are much better than than other animals in terms of attributing causation to interactions between physical objects as well. Um, so I think, yeah, there's, you know, the, the, I think language plays a critical role because it allows us to communicate in a in a far wider um, area of design space, if you like, than, than animals that lack language. Um, but yeah, also the ability to generalize the ability. I mean, I think you know, I talked about theory of mind in the in the talk and argued that it's not critical for teaching. But nevertheless, if you can use theory of mind and teaching, clearly that expands the scope for it enormously. So I think you, with any attempt to try and pinpoint kind of this is the reason is bound to fail because there are many, many different reasons. Probably population structure as well is going to be important beyond simply thinking about cognitive uh, abilities. Well, thank you. And then I was trying to like struggling with these things in the neural networks that we are trying to implement. They're very good at very specific tasks, yeah. but then any attempt to generalize fails miserably. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, that's, you know, people often argue that the idea of artificial intelligence at the moment is a misnomer because you can, you know, you can design systems that learn and they learn one thing and they can be exceptionally good at one thing and they can beat the grandmaster at chess, but they don't exhibit intelligence in the classic sense, which means acquiring information in one context and using it flexibly to solve problems in another. Um, so I guess that's you know, the goal for, for AI that uh, has yet to be realized. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, sir. Um, Professor Bhavani, would you like to? Yes, there's uh, both uh, Sophia and me over here. And hi. Hello. This is Bhavani. Sophia and maybe Sophia you go first. And then yes, go um, I was wondering if really all societies use teaching in their culture because when I was a, I'm, I'm a psychologist 
And I was doing a project when I was a university student with disadvantaged families, poor, uneducated, and I've, they have they don't actually talk to their children. They don't communicate. They don't use language. They they don't show their children anything. That means they don't modify their own behavior to teach the children, and they only react physical punishment if their children annoy them. But there's actually no really no real communication happening between the parents and the children. So I'm wondering, um, like. Is it really so that all human societies use teaching and some what are the prerequisites that this can happen? Because if they're just surviving from day to day life, they don't they cannot invest so much to actually teach their children. Yeah. So I guess that investment is the is that's why teaching is a mystery, because it requires an investment. Um, so I think to answer your question, the answer is probably yes, all human societies use teaching, although in many cases it's subtle and not explicit. So, for example, in um, thinking about interactions between parents and offspring in, in hunter gatherer societies, a lot of the teaching interactions that we see are not explicit, they're not even verbal in a lot of cases, um, but they involve subtle cues, providing um, offspring with opportunities to learn that they might not otherwise have, providing a safe environment for learning, so scaffolding and so on. You mentioned, you know, the people you've been working with don't seem to communicate with their children explicitly i would imagine that if one studied them in detail there is a lot of subtle communication that might not be so overt you mentioned punishment punishment could often be used as a form of teaching right so if a child does something that you don't want to do, you punish them you're effectively teaching them not to do it again um so you know there may be some people somewhere who for whatever reason maybe as a you know for pathological reasons don't teach um, but I think that teaching is something that characterizes all human societies, yeah. Well, anyway, that was in Germany um, mm. where I studied and and these are really, really the, the, the most disadvantaged families and mm. drug addicts, alcoholics, whatever. Mm. And children also did very well at school, obviously. So they yeah. learned a lot to learn. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's actually funny, but you just made a comment and it says that actually punishment is a way of non-verbal teaching of not to do something because you said that you need language to say to somebody how not to do something mm -hmm. but maybe punishment is it's not necessarily verbal you beat somebody and then they know that they don't do it you give some well, kind but of punishment. it's it's interesting because actually the evidence for um for punishment in order to promote cooperation in other animals is very lacking and i think it's for it's, the same reason that you know if um so say for example some people have argued that there's some some animal societies that are that are cooperative breeders so you've got a single pair who raise most of the offspring also who produce the offspring and the rest of the group how to care for the offspring and so some people have argued that perhaps what might be going on there is that if some of these helper animals don't pull their weight the the dominant individuals will punish them so that they cooperate more but actually, there's very little evidence that that happens because, again, it's really hard. So imagine that you're a meerkat, for example, and you haven't been feeding the pups enough. And so the dominant female comes and beats you up. You don't know why she's beaten you up, right? You know, she, she can't tell you I'm beating you up because you haven't fed the kids. You know, she could be beating you up because you got too close or because you ate her favorite scorpion or, you know, for any you know, you don't know. And so in the absence of language and also the cognitive processes that allow us to understand language, um, that kind of teaching via punishment is, is quite difficult. And um, so it seems to be pretty rare in animals, but fairly common in humans. That's so interesting. I thought great apes use punishment. Like, like they, if the child does something and they overstep their boundaries, great apes, I've seen that on some documentary, they use punishment. Yeah, so there's no, there are sort of anecdotal reports of things like punishment. There's no systematic evidence um, that, that they use punishment in this way. So it'd be really interesting to study that. Um, but at the moment, you know, all we have is a few stories and it's kind of, it's always hard to interpret an anecdote. I'll ask, uh, not really a question, it's just kind of thinking aloud. Um, so you were talking about how humans and maybe others use tools without really understanding how to use a tool. And I remember when part of the work that we, the, the reason we started the lab was because we were trying to pro solve India's problem of skill development. We have like whatever, like close to 100 million people, um, 
500 million people that need to be trained in like 10 years on vocational skills so that they can make some kind of a livelihood but we don't have the infrastructure to deal with the problem and so how can you use technology basically to teach people but vocational skills it's not just regular education right so it's so much of doing things with your hands and and practicing and stuff like that so one of the things is that we found when we first started basically making uh, digital content and we work on building simulators uh, apart from the content is that we found that only all the textbooks they had a lot of uh, you had to learn a lot of stuff before you learned how to do the actual practice so there's so much of theory that you had to learn mm -hmm. and then i remember thinking that do we really have to learn how all this theory to do the the job you may be able to actually do it just fine without actually learning all the theory and we even did a few experiments where we taught some people the theory and we didn't teach people. So we actually then reversed our model. So we started teaching people how to do things first and then teaching them the rationale behind it after, but not first, because then they just get bored and they just get lost in the whole thing. Like, for example, teach how women to mix cement, right? So you need proportions for that. So instead of going into fractions and proportions, they do it automatically like they cook. Nobody taught them how to scale from cooking for four people to 400 people they do it automatically somehow without ever yeah. learning all mathematics so they know this intuitively they i will not say intuition because you don't like the word intuition but they know it somehow and and they're able to do it so why go through fractions to begin with so first teach them how to do it and then you can go back later uh, for them to maybe translate that knowledge to something else and and so, so there's this constant battle between the formal uh, training uh, curriculum and our approaches because we we feel that it's just so much better to go with this this other way where they can learn without necessarily having to understand all the details of mm. how to use a tool or to perform a task yeah. and then you can add layers later of mm. complexity understanding yeah. uh, so I, I remember going through that whole process and so that slide that you said um, was very interesting. The second thing that I wanted to talk about, because you're talking about this knowledge gap and and really the such a close link between the audience or the, the taught and the teacher uh, is so seems to be such almost like a fulcrum to teaching. And then this we have this whole because of COVID now this is really thrown it to our faces, even though we've been working on online distance education since 2009. Now it's like really in everybody's face, but but you you really don't have necessarily the contact between the person who's teaching. Like for you, you were giving a talk, and for the most part of it, you were talking to, I don't know, just little boxes at the bottom of your screen. And with the exception of Sid, you probably just didn't know anybody else. Then, then what would that not classify anything of what you were saying as teaching, but just like maybe transfer of information? And now. When there is interaction only is when teaching happens but that's also not true right so i don't know um how does that whole um... yeah it's interesting i mean i guess it's worth remembering that the 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 definitions i presented are definitions to do with the evolution of teaching the origins of teaching um and so you know in this case we are using traits that we have that you know we've been using through face-to-face -face interactions and we're now capable of using them when we're dealing with each other on screens, but they clearly didn't evolve in the context of screens. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting in terms of, I mean, you guys will know far more about this than I do. We're having a similar issue at my university, right, where a lot of our teaching is now going to have to be online because of COVID. I wonder about how effective it's going to be. I mean, I think it will be effective, but I doubt whether it will be as effective because, you know, you just you can't build this kind of rapport um, because, you know, as I said, I think one of the key issues in teaching is that it involves this coordinated interaction between teachers and pupils, you know, so it's kind of it's by bi, it's bi-directional. Um, and it's I think you can do that through online means, but it's harder to do. You guys will be you know, experts in this much more than I will. Um, but I think, you know, I guess the, the fundamental idea that you know, teaching is an investment in helping others to learn that's true regardless of whether we're interacting in real life or on a screen you know i could have been doing something else right now but i'm you know making an investment in and trying to do some teaching that was such an important link that you made between teaching and sustainability i mean we know that mm -hmm. naturally we teaching is completely linked to sustainability but yeah, yeah. it just again just pushed it again to the forefront it's uh, almost yeah. like a 
critical uh, element of sustaining anything. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But yeah, I thought your, your earlier point was really, really interesting as well. The idea that, you know, for a lot of things, we don't necessarily need to understand how they work in order to, to learn them effectively. Um, and I guess maybe, I don't know if, certainly in the UK, there's a, I think there's a hang up where um, sort of academic education was seen somehow as better yes. than, yes, than yes. vocational education. And I think as a result, because I, I, you know, I'm always trying to encourage my students to think conceptually. And I was telling them, you know, we're learning theories. And so if you don't understand the fundamental building blocks of the theory, you can't apply them. So, but, you know, if I was teaching them how to mix cement, that would be utterly useless. Um, so I think, you know, this, this idea that, you know, actually there are perhaps different ways of teaching, depending on whether you're trying to teach people to, you know, perform a behavior that has some you know explicit function like mixing cement or kind of more conceptual ideas they probably involve very different kinds of teaching or they should ideally mm. and i was also thinking that maybe we should just build a lot more simulators that will just help people practice 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 mm. uh, till yeah. they get like really excellent skills and then the theoretical learning can can happen uh, in context as yeah. opposed to yeah, 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 absolutely. A more natural way of learning for most yeah. people. Yeah, that's certainly the way that most teaching happens in, you know, outside of kind of industrialized settings. Um, also, but in, settings. Even in developed countries, 90% of the people actually go into vocational education, only 10% go into tertiary education mm -hmm. yeah. across any country. So yeah, yeah. that 90% of the people are learning somehow differently. Yeah. Yeah. From the ten percent, and at the ten, this is what my argument would sit. The ten percent designs education for the ninety percent, and I have yeah. a problem with. No, I think I think you. Yeah, I think you're very right there. Yeah, the meerkats also don't know theory. <laughs> yeah. Meerkats the know nothing. There's a bunch of hand raises, so we'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. Thank you, Thank you. Professor Roman. Thank you, um, Dr. Bawani and Dr. Zafia. So we have uh, three raised hands. One is. Um, um, from um, Gayatri, Madam, and Rajesh, Sir, and Sit. This would be the the order. Um, yeah, um, Gayatri, Chiji, can you can you raise your question? Yeah, thank you so much. The talk was so interesting. Um, it was very very beautiful to read your paper and listen to your work. Um, there was one thing I uh, wa wanted to uh, understand a little better. Um, in your work, you refer to the fitness payoff and the utility of teaching. So by that, um, does that mean there is no evidence of altruism in teaching in animals at all? Uh, because altruism in teaching, I think uh, we can observe in humans. Mm -hmm. But uh, is it true that it doesn't exist in animals? There's always a payoff? Um, yeah, so that's a, it's an interesting question. It's kind of a philosophical question in lots of ways. But from the point of view of thinking about how a trait can evolve, then a, a purely altruistic trait, which is something that I do for you, it benefits you and it has no benefit whatsoever to me ever, that cannot evolve. So under Darwinian principles, it's impossible for a trait like that to evolve. Um, and so there are there are big so you know from that point of view the first part of your question was is there anything like altruistic teaching in animals yeah, no there isn't I think the second question is is there anything that's truly altruistic teaching in humans and that's you know it's an interesting debate because in lots of situations you know you may be you may not derive an immediate benefit through your teaching. So, for example, you know, if I'm teaching my offspring something, clearly that benefits me in terms of the propagation of my genes. If I'm teaching my students something, that might benefit me in terms of my reputation. If I'm teaching a complete stranger who I've never met before, that could also benefit me in terms of reputation. So it's quite it's difficult to to find scenarios in which um, you know you can you can say for sure this is completely altruistic. But I guess the more important issue is that although instances of altruism may occur when we're thinking about something on a population level as an evolved trait it can't have evolved as an altruistic trait it has to have evolved because it provided some benefits once it's evolved then perhaps you know there may be cases in which 
individuals might perform acts of altruism. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, because I mean, uh, why I say is that in Indian uh, philosophy or in the Indian thought, right? There, uh, uh, I mean, there are maybe there is a difference in our understanding of teaching. What what constitutes a teaching? But I mean, there are uh, like, for example. Uh, if you talk about spiritual masters or you talk about, you know, people, uh, they may teach you, they may, in fact, they keep teaching you, but there isn't any, at least in the human context, or uh, I mean, in that sense, there is no real benefit for what they're doing. So in that sense, at least as we experience it or as we know it, I, I, I just felt that in the Indian culture, uh, it is accepted that there could be teaching without any benefit to the teacher. There will be benefit to the learner for sure, because I mean, otherwise, what the, it isn't a teaching at all. Um, but I mean, I just wondered uh, whether it's just a uh, you know, human uh, trait or characteristic, or it is something even beyond that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you, um, Gayatri, Madam. So we might extend our session today. We already extended. It's really so exciting also to hear the questions and the talk was very interesting, maybe for more uh, 10 minutes. Um, if um, Dr. Alex is okay, we have two um, more raised hands here. Uh, one is Professor Sid and the other one was uh, Rajesh, sir, but he don't raise his hand anymore. So I'm not sure if, it's, um, if the question got answered. Uh, so, Dr. Sid, would you like to um, uh, raise your question or to comment? Sure. Thank you very much. Alex, uh, great talk, as usual. Uh, it's all very exciting. And the questions uh, from the uh, group were also uh, exciting for me. So, look, I have, as I'm sure you know, uh, many questions to ask. I'll only ask two small ones. One is, you mentioned it's sort of uh, uh, local in some ways, but not so local. You mentioned about the importance of uh, teaching through screens uh, versus humans being together. And you talked about rapport. And rapport is, uh, uh, has emotional components to it. And I was wondering if there's anything like that in non-humans. If the idea of report uh, is appropriate there, so that's one quick question. And the second one is, is that uh, how do you account for what I think is the case, and that is that teaching among non-human animals is quite restricted, often about survival, whereas among human beings, you name it, it's so unrestricted. Uh, just go on uh, YouTube and you'll see teaching the most uh, incredible and uh, who would ever think about teaching anything that people are teaching there. So human beings have a vast array of, of what it is that is being taught. And the teaching might be similar in this vast array of the content versus non-human animals that uh, I think the teaching is around issues of uh, survival. And thanks again for really a superb talk. Okay, thanks, Sid. Um, so the first part of your question was about rapport, and I think um, yes, there you know there there are equivalents to rapport in other animals. So we know yeah, hormonally, for example, oxytocin plays a role in social bonding in humans, and it does it plays a similar role in other mammals as well. And there are avian equivalents of oxytocin as well. So, you know, clearly those things play a, play a role in bonding. With the the birds that I study at the moment, so I study jackdaws, which are birds from the crow family, and these are birds that pair up for life, so they effectively form a marriage. And there's clear differences in the rapport of different pairs. So you have some pairs that, to put it anthropomorphically, are very lovey-dovey. They spend all their time together. They're always preening each other. And other pairs that are far more aloof. So there, there clearly is variation in rapport. And I think um, it hasn't been studied, but I would expect that, you know, if we could quantify that variation in rapport, um, it would have an influence on teaching because I think a really important aspect of teaching is, is attention. 
And so I think what rapport does is it focuses attention. You know, you're going to pay more attention to somebody you like than somebody you don't like. Um, so it, it would be really hard to study, but it would be a really interesting area to try and uh, to try and address in in other animals. And the second part of your question was to do with the yeah the fact that teaching in meerkats and other animals is to do with survival and teaching in humans is to do with all all sorts of things that are unrelated to survival. I think that the important difference, the important thing to think about here is to distinguish trying to understand the origins of something versus what happens now. So if we think about the origins of human teaching, why did so as far as we know, other great apes don't teach. There's very little evidence for teaching in other great apes. There's a little bit of evidence in chimpanzees. I don't find it very convincing. Um, so then, you know, ancestral hominids at some point started to do something that their relatives didn't do. And so to understand that, I think that that why teaching began to emerge is about survival. My suspicion is that it's to do with the use of tools for extractive foraging. Um, and, you know, if you didn't have good tools to because, you know, we left the, the trees, we entered the savannas where this kind of small bodied, weak primate um, and we're not going to be very good at extracting food without tools. So we became very reliant on tools. And um, so, you know, in that context, if I'm right, then then teaching evolved in the context of, of a survival skill. But because tool making is quite complex and it involves not only understanding you know how to build a tool but perhaps why a tool works one one tool works better than another we also started to evolve you know all these other cognitive traits which now we use in teaching like theory of mind like causal reasoning eventually language and all of these things mean that once we've got those we can we can teach in in an infinite number of contexts so you know so that's kind of my my little um potted just so story of why we teach in lots of different contexts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alex. Um, we um, have uh, the raised hand of uh, Dr. Bavani. Maybe we can have this as the last um, um, question to then soon come to the end of the session. I just wanted to uh, comment on the last in exchange of ideas and I'm playing the devil's advocate, but I'm just maybe suggesting that maybe teaching is an it starts off as an exhibition of your own knowledge, you know, like how animals like flout their feathers and they do a little dance basically showing how great they are. Maybe you're ex a person exposing or showing people how much they know maybe is an expression of well, I know so much, maybe kind of also. I mean, I'm being the devil's advocate. Here you're trying to say the teaching is completely altruistic and I'm saying that maybe it's actually a sh I'm sorry, maybe it, I, this is not the comment I should be saying, but maybe it comes when you, you want to exhibit how much you know uh, also. Maybe it's so ego driven also. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I mean, I guess from from my point of view, teaching isn't altruistic because the teacher ultimately has to gain in some way. Um, but what, what you're saying is it's it's redolent of there's an idea developed by an Israeli biologist called Amot Zahavi. Um, I don't know if you ever met Amot, Sid. Um, anyway, he's a, he was a very strong exponent of this idea called the handicap principle, which is the notion that lots of um, forms of behavior, including cooperative behavior, are basically ways of showing off. You know, I'm just doing this, as you say, to kind of show you how much knowledge I have. Um, I guess that could be true um, in order for, for that to kind of function as an evolutionary hypothesis. We need to understand how showing off ultimately generates some payoff to me. So you know, if you all think I'm very knowledgeable, that's of no use to me unless I somehow gain something from it. Um, but it's certainly plausible that it, you know, it could happen. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you so much. I just personally thank you so much for such no, a wonderful thank you. It's been a, It's been a pleasure. Thank you to all of you and for all the great questions too. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Bavani, and also thank you, really, and I think I talk here in the behalf of all the other um, plenum participants who could not uh, raise their questions due to the time constraints, so it was really, really, really very informative and uh, very um, nice to see learning from that perspective and, and teaching, of course, and uh, yeah, so again, a warm um, thank you towards you, Dr. Alex. And a warm welcome also into our um, Amachi Labs family. So we consider you already as part of our family. So, um, and uh, we are really looking forward to maybe other um, op opportunities to interact with you. Well, that's great. It's a great privilege. Thank you. So then uh, let us uh, slowly come to an end. Um, if maybe um, Dr. Bavani or Prof Dr. Sid don't uh, want to mention anything um, finally, uh, then we would uh, close up today's session. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to say just one quick thing. Alex, uh, terrific job. Um, for the, the years that we know each other, you know that I don't agree with uh, some of what you say, but the vast majority I do uh, agree with, and uh, I'll write to you afterwards, and we can argue again on these on these issues. But it's very, very obvious uh, what it was that you were trying to tell us, and it was clearly presented um, uh, with a wonderful style as well. So, thank you for taking time out to be with us. Uh, this is the bread and butter of academic life, as you know, passing on information to other people, uh, <clears throat> trying to uh, stir thoughts, uh, getting questions that you're not sure. Even if you give an answer, you go home and you say, well, I didn't quite answer that so well. And then you have to think about it some more so you can uh, understand it better, et cetera. So uh, it was really a very stimulating uh, very stimulating talk and really uh, heartfelt gratitude for taking time out, getting up early in the morning uh, to share your ideas with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you too for inviting me. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful greeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. You, Thank you. Was a wonderful.